Good afternoon, everyone. Please uh, continue to enjoy your dinner. Uh, some of you are at dessert time. If you'd like seconds, that's fine. Just hold up your hand. They'll bring you additional cakes and pies and so forth. My name is Neil Lane. I'm a senior fellow at the Baker Institute. It's my pleasant duty to welcome you to Rice University and the Baker Institute on behalf of Ambassador Jurigian, who's here at table two. Uh, for this annual Civic Scientist Lecture, and today our lecture is, as you know, Dr. Subra Suresh. I also want to welcome the many attendees in the audience from the Transatlantic Science Week, an extraordinary conference which is being hosted by the Royal Norwegian Consulate General of Houston in partnership with MD Anderson and Rice. We, it is a wonderful event. We're so delighted to be a part of it. This afternoon's lecture is part of the Baker Institute Civic Scientist Program, which highlights outstanding scientists and engineers who, in addition to making significant contributions in their own fields of research, also devote a portion of their careers to doing other things, things that, that might be viewed as the, in broad, broad terms as a public service, either by serving in government or by many other mechanisms. Our goal is to encourage others to follow their example, and more generally, to try to promote a dialogue to help bridge the divide that exists, at least in our country, between science and the rational public process of rational public policymaking. We're endeavoring to spread the word about a vital link that does exist between science and the public good, and we're doing that through both the lecture series and our outreach program, which last year sent a dozen scientists and engineers into the local middle and high schools, affecting more than 1,000 students. Prior to today's lecture, the Civic Scientist Series has hosted eight prominent speakers at Rice, including Shirley Ann Jackson, some people you may know here, Bruce Alberts, Jane Lubchenco, Arden Bement, former NSF director, David Baltimore, Alice Wong, Robert Curl and Harry Croto co-discovers the Buckyballs. And I can't think of a better name to add to this list than our speaker today, Subra Suresh. But before introducing Dr. Suresh, I wanna thank those who made today's event possible through their generous sponsorship. Uh, the Civic Scientist Program has received enthusiastic support from Rice, specifically the Weiss School of Natural Sciences, Dean Dan Carson, the Brown School of Engineering, Dean Ned Thomas. In addition, I want to give special thanks to Rice alum Janice Hartrick and her JWC JKH Family Foundation for their generous support of the program. I'd also like to thank our co-hosts, <clears throat> the Royal Norwegian Consulate General of Houston. This Civic Scientist Lecture is also a part of the Baker Institute's Shell Distinguished Lecture Series. And here to join me in welcoming everyone this afternoon and to speak about Shell's work on the campus is Mr. Uh, Fayez Bojani. Dr. Bojani is an, a medical doctor. He currently serves as chief medical officer for Shell Oil Company. He's health lead for Shell's manufacturing operations worldwide, manages all of Shell's operations in North and South America. He's held many positions with Shell and has worked and traveled widely across the globe. He is currently co-leading oh, a well-being and human performance initiative uh, to develop a culture of health within Shell. In addition to his work at Shell, uh, Fayez is actively involved in teaching and community service and has faculty appointments in several institutions. So please welcome Dr. Fayez Bojani. Good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Lane. Appreciate it. Uh, my task today is to introduce Dr. Subra Suresh. You know, this is, a, this is a difficult task because Dr. Suresh does not require any introduction. A scientist of his caliber, of his reputation, does not require any introduction whatsoever. Yeah? But because I have been given this task, I will do my best to, to do this in one or so minute. Dr. Suresh was nominated by President Barack Obama and unanimously confirmed by the Senate, and you're all aware of the importance of the word unanimous nowadays, 
as the director of the National Science Foundation about two years ago in September of 2010. He's a distinguished engineer and scientist uh, who previously served as the dean of uh, School of Engineering and the one of our Bush Professor of Engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. His uh, work in experimental and modeling on the mechanical properties of structural and functional materials, innovations in materials designs and characterization, and discoveries of possible connections between cellular nanomechanical processes and human disease states have shaped many a new fields in the fertile intersections of the traditional disciplines. He has co-authored over 200 articles, has 21 patents to his credits, and more maybe, and authored of three widely uh, read books in the area. Uh, I am delighted and humbled at the same time to welcome Dr. Subra Suresh. Please welcome him to the podium. Thank you so much. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I want to thank uh, Dr. Neil Lane and the Baker Institute for uh, inviting me here. Uh, I want to spend about 30 minutes uh, talking about science and engineering and NSF's role um, in fostering that. But because it's a civic scientist lecture, and the general notion of what constitutes civic science um, is something that I may want to start with. Civic gives the notion that we're dealing with an issue that concerns society, the public, and something that does good for the society. So it's a natural point to start with the National Science Foundation because nothing contributes to the society more positively than research and education in science and engineering. And that's essentially the mission of the National Science Foundation. So um, I'll see if I can capture all the things that NSF uh, has to offer in that particular context uh, with respect to the nation and, and the world. Let me, um, in fact, the very founding of the National Science Foundation um, was in that spirit. Uh, when Dr. Vannevar Bush uh, wrote his uh, famous report to the US government, where he argued that basic research in science and engineering is necessary for innovation and therefore economic prosperity. And he further argued that it's the role and responsibility of the government to foster that through support of basic research. And um, that's how NSF got started. Now, let me go to the first slide and talk a little about where NSF stands today uh, in the national and international scene. Our annual budget is about $7 billion, and uh, we'll see whether we move past, well past the $7 billion or try to fluctuate in that range uh, in the coming few months. It's going to be an enormous challenge. There are several unique things about the National Science Foundation. Um, all the money we receive, minus an overhead rate of about 5.8%, goes back to the community. There is no internal research. Uh, everything that NSF receives, minus the cost of managing it, which is less than 6%, is given back to the community. Our mandate is to fund all fields of science and engineering, um, basic science and engineering and related education, with the singular exception of clinical research. So last year, this translated into 300,000 individuals in the US who were supported. Unfortunately, the demand for resources far surpasses our ability to support it. Um, but nevertheless, I think um, uh, this has seen a, uh, the level of support has seen a significant increase over time, especially in the last 62 years. And one of the major um, objectives, missions of NSF, 
is to walk a very fine line between supporting individuals and thereby contributing to human capital development for the country in science and engineering, and at the same time, supporting what I would call big science through large facilities where you can keep different disciplines in the US at the forefront of the scientific enterprise on a global scale. And it may seem like a contradiction sometimes, so let me give you an example. If you take the mathematic, um, mathematics division in the mathematics and physical sciences directorate at NSF, the vast majority of funding goes for individual scholarship. Same is true in computer science. But if you take astronomy as another example, most of the funding, uh, more than half the funding, goes for large facilities. And this is from the community, not from NSF. NSF doesn't decide on this ratio. It comes from the community. And this is why we often uh, joke internally that uh, big ideas galvanize a nation, whether it's a big telescope or a ship uh, or an activity in Antarctica or the Arctic uh, Circle. They galvanize a, a nation and they bring people into science, like the Sputnik moment, for example. And this is why this morning um, I, I joked that uh, you know, we, we want to put man on the moon, but remember, we put wheels on the suitcase after we put man on the moon. And uh, wheels on the suitcase is what I mean by individual scholarship, which could also enable putting man on the moon. And um, I have to repeat the joke in Houston, because this is where things happen with respect to putting man on the moon. Um, the goal is to fund the best people and the best ideas. And as imperfect as a, a government system may be, uh, it's widely regarded around the world that the peer review system that NSF and our sister agencies have developed and perfected over the last 60 years or so is pretty much a gold standard. Um, and a number of countries have recently established science funding agencies modeled after the National Science Foundation in the last decade, from Ireland to China to India to South Korea to Nigeria to Vietnam. Uh, they have established science funding agencies, which are some variations of the National Science Foundation. Here are some data points that I want to mention. Uh, since about 1951, since NSF came into existence, we have supported two, more than 200 American Nobel laureates, with some part of the Nobel Prize winning work being supported by NSF. That constitutes about 70% of all the American Nobel laureates since 19, 1951. And this year, half of all the 2012 Nobel laureates had NSF support, including um, in physics, medicine, economics, and other fields. In economics, since 1951, 47 Nobel laureates have been supported for their Nobel Prize winning work, including both the Nobel laureates this year. And um, I want to repeat the story of this year's Nobel Prize winning work in economics for a particular reason. This year's work was initially funded up by our economic science, economics uh, division, which is part of our social behavioral and economic sciences directorate. And the work was funded purely for economics research. And in the last five years, it also had co-funding uh, from computer and information science and engineering. But the work was for mathematical modeling in economics and optimization. But the biggest application of that is to match kidney donors with patients waiting for kidney donations. So who would have imagined in any of the peer review panels that an economics research would lead to that kind of an application? And this is this kind of a long-term perspective that you need to take. By the way, that work was funded, has been funded continuously since 1979 without interruption by NSF as an individual grant. Uh, graduate research fellowships and young people, we were talking about this this morning with our distinguished Norwegian colleagues. And this work, the NSF-funded graduate research fellows alone have won 40 Nobel Prizes including two this year who were selected for NSF Graduate Research Fellowships. That's a very high success rate uh, in, the, in that pool. 
And then we can talk about industrial, uh, social, and economic impact of all of this. So let me give, this is our past. Going to the future, what are the challenges that we face? I think there are enormous challenges that we face uh, ind individually as a science funding agency, collectively as a nation, or even on a larger scale on a global science and engineering, uh, uh, fr from a global science and engineering uh, perspective. First is, we face a lot of global challenges from pandemics to water shortages to mass migration of people, uh, urban infrastructure uh, constraints, um, the environment, uh, energy, sustainability, et cetera, et cetera. In trying to understand this, all the funding agencies are by regulation constrained to operate within their national policies, laws, and guidelines because we all use taxpayer money and we cannot send taxpayer money from one country to another country that freely, understandably so. But all of the challenges have no barriers. Take infectious disease as an example. All it takes for an infectious disease to go from one part of the world to a diametrically opposite part of the world is an airline flight. There are no barriers to infectious disease. SARS was a very good example a few years ago. So given that, how do funding agencies collaborate on an international scale while we try to conform to local policies and laws? This is a challenge that, to my knowledge, nobody has sorted out. So we'll come to some partial answers to these. The second is the borderless knowledge enterprise. So you can access knowledge funded by anybody, paid for by anybody, any taxpayer, from anywhere in the world almost instantly. So if that is the case, whose laws are you bound, bound by and how do you protect intellectual property? And how do you create an infrastructure that ensures that the right reward mechanisms are in place for the right discoveries? that are fostered by uh, science. Shifting demographics is another huge thing. So let's take one data point. Last year, the most recent year for which we have data, the number of undergraduate freshmen enrolled in universities and colleges and community colleges in all the 50 states of the United States, plus the number of undergraduate freshmen in all the 27 countries of the European Union, plus the number, number of undergraduate freshmen in all the universities in Japan, so three highly developed parts of the world, equaled the number of undergraduate freshmen just in China last year. So that's the input. Let's look at the output. In terms of output, the research funding and graduates in universities and colleges in Asia with degrees in either engineering or natural sciences is significantly higher than that in the United States. Both those numbers are significantly higher. So the input is higher, the output is higher. So if you extrapolate it 10 years down the road, half of all the scientists and engineers a decade or two decades from now are going to probably come from two countries, China and India and especially given the young demographics, especially of India. And Indonesia is another country where the population is very young. So that's the shifting demographics in the science and engineering context that I'm, I'm referring to. Shifting economics. So we have countries, small countries, like Qatar and Singapore, or large countries such as uh, China, increasingly investing in R&D not only to move up the science and engineering ladder for innovation, but also as a means to lift hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. And given that trend, um, what would the shifting demographics and shifting economics mean for the future of science and engineering? And this is something that we cannot ignore. So given that it's a borderless knowledge enterprise in a rapidly shifting demographics with changing economics and financial crises, and given the fact that we have less than annual budgeting process for funding agencies in the US, how do we position for this distant future in the current climate? And this is our biggest challenge. 
So I want to take, talk about two things with respect to the excitement of science. And we've internally, in the last couple of years, with my senior leadership team, talked about what is so exciting about science and what is so exciting about the science that NSF sponsors. Um, we can look at it in many different ways, and there is no unique way to do this. We've come up, come up with, a, with a categorization in two categories in this way. If you look at any field of science and engineering, one of the biggest excitements is that we live in a new era of observation where we can make an observation, whether it's experimental, computational, or theoretical, with a sophistication, resolution, scope, scale, and reach that we could not have imagined five years ago. So what do I mean by that? The NSF-funded South Pole facility in Antarctica, our telescope, three weeks ago, discovered an entirely new galaxy, which we could not have done mere five years ago. Um, three years ago, we drilled, two and a half years ago, we drilled down three kilometers into Antarctic ice to talk about, to, to, to learn about carbon capture, to learn about the pollution levels in the world, climate change, et cetera, that we could not have done a few years ago. So that's at the extreme of very large distances and length scales. At the other extreme, we have pico-newton level force measurements, sub-nanotechnology, uh, femtoscale measurements uh, in many scientific disciplines. And of course, appropriately at RICE, nanotechnology was a, is a key part of um, innovations in RICE over the last two decades. So this is the excitement of the new era of observation. And the important thing is that these era, this new era of observation not only couples how we can study a single DNA molecule, we can couple that, the biology of a neuron in the human brain with the psychology of the human mind in ways in which we could not have done five years ago. So that merging of disciplines is truly remarkable. And this spreads across every field of science and engineering, including social, behavioral, and economic sciences. This new era of observation creates another new era, which is the era of data and information. So I just uh, went to Wyoming and opened a new uh, facility for atmospheric research just three weeks ago. Uh, the National Center for Atmospheric Research supercomputer facility built by IBM. It's a 1.5 petaflop weather prediction simulation capability computer, first in the state of Wyoming and among the fastest in the world. And it has 10 petabytes of storage capacity. That coupled with the fact that you can take your iPad and your iPad now generates about a terabyte of data. And the latest telescope that NSF just jointly commissioned with the Department of Energy, which will come into existence six years from now, will generate 10 terabytes of data per day. We are in the era of big data in every field. So given that, and given the fact that each of the mobile devices that we all carry contributes to the scientific enterprise and data, which is the long tail of the data, the question arises, what do funding agencies like the National Science Foundation do to take these mountains of data and capture knowledge out of it and extract useful knowledge out of it while protecting privacy, confidentiality, intellectual property, while confining, being confined within the laws and regulations? and archiving all of this in perpetuity across rapidly changing platforms. And how do we do this? And what new science do we, do, do we need to do today so that 10 years from now, the rate of data generation doesn't streak too far ahead of data curation and archiving? Because we, we, we don't know what to do yet. And this is a challenge for us, not just for our computer and information science and engineering, but all of NSF. So we spend a lot of time worrying about this. This is the other excitement of science today. This also enables an individual citizen, a middle school child, actually a middle school child in Texas, this young girl uh, participated in the discovery of a new planet just a few years ago through portable devices and interacting with scientists. So with that kind of a possibility, how do we use it positively for education is another major challenge for us. Changing environment and global challenges. So this is a time-lapse photography of the melting of the Arctic ice. And this is uh, a photo, this year we had the lowest ever recorded 
uh, ice mass in the Arctic uh, after the summer melting. And the question is, what do we do and how do we support research in this area? Um, there are many different ways in which we can engage. There are more than 15 countries that collaborate with us and Norway being one of the partners for us. And what kind of research do we do? So the next slide shows a ship that we built and launched three weeks ago, built on time and on budget, which will go to the Arctic. The Arctic Ocean is almost completely covered by sea ice for most of the year, which makes getting there a real challenge. Today, the National Science Foundation and the University of Alaska Fairbanks unveil the RV Sukuyak, one of the most advanced research vessels in the world. So, so this ship, Apparently, these days, the way to launch a ship is to tilt it 60 degrees and push it into the water. And we were all standing there, worried that it may just uh, tip over a little bit, but fortunately, that did not happen. And um, this is the Antarctic facility, South Pole Amundsen Scott Station. And um, um, this is a facility where the National Science Foundation has the responsibility. In fact, exactly one year ago this week, I visited that building and uh, that was also the 100th anniversary of Amundsen's trip from Norway to the South Pole. And uh, the Prime Minister of Norway visited, us, visited the facility about a month later. And this is a very heavy infrastructure um, project. 85% of the cost of science is infrastructure. It costs many gallons of gasoline to deliver one gallon of gasoline to the South Pole. And this building that you see there on your right uh, was commissioned about three years ago. It's the only functioning um, uh, building and science facility right at the geographic South Pole. And these things are important because the, both the poles tell us about changing climate uh, in the entire planet. And there is also significant commercial interest in the Arctic th this year because of changing in weather patterns. I just want to take a few minutes to highlight some of the major uh, cross-cutting initiatives, not just at NSF, but across the federal government uh, that we are looking at. I won't go through it individually, but let me just list a few of them, from cybersecurity to sustainability to robotics to nanotechnology to observing real-time networks, Arctic and Antarctic, and the live streaming data that evolves out of them and various strategic plans that we are developing in collaboration with other federal agencies uh, for the Arctic and for also um, other parts of um, other issues that deal with the environment. Uh, manufacturing, advanced manufacturing initiatives and materials genome initiative. Uh, these are all a variety of activities where NSF uh, plays a major role. I want to finish um, with a few things that we've been focusing our attention on, partly to address some of the changes that I talked about, um, uh, major changes taking place in the scientific enterprise and also on a global scale, and what can agencies like the National Science Foundation do? So we know that all the activities are increasingly interdisciplinary, but we need a disciplinary core. And how do we support, and, and the forefront of science that is moving at a much faster rate then all institutions are able to respond, whether it's a university or a federal agency. We have silos and departments and schools and colleges where uh, it's very difficult to change the enterprise in response to the rapidly changing forefront of science. So one of the things that we introduced last year as a partial attempt uh, to foster greater interdisciplinary research, but also to change the way NSF internally does business, is to create a program called INSPIRE. So I have to apologize for all the fancy acronyms you're going to hear, but this is uh, Washington um, terminology, but you have to put up with me. This uh, program, the idea is this. You bring together people from seemingly disconnected or unconnected fields, and then you give a central pool of money and you let the program officers take over at that point so that they can leverage the central pool of money to support research across different disciplines that usually don't get funded. So we want to fund interdisciplinary research. And interdisciplinary doesn't mean you need to have a huge team. One individual can, can be highly interdisciplinary. 
The second thing is that uh, you want to fund research that's sufficiently for a long period of time and it's, it's willing to accommodate high risk. Often interdisciplinary research uh, doesn't get much support if it's risky. So the first year, I was delighted to see that 40 projects were funded. Pretty much every part of NSF had a connection with another part of NSF that it had not previously worked with. So we have created a variety of metrics to make sure five years down the road that the metrics for success will be captured appropriately by taking into account things that get funded beyond traditional uh, mechanisms of funding. So this program at steady state will be $120 million a year. So second year, uh, next week or week after next, there'll be a new solicitation coming out for mid-scale projects and for individual awards and this will be a five-year funding mechanism. We introduced about a year ago a project called SAVI, Science Across Virtual Institutes. The idea is the following. As a federal funding agency, we cannot send American taxpayer money abroad. That's a given. Many overseas funding agencies have the same constraint. But scientists are not bound by these bureauc bureaucratic rules. They love to collaborate on an international scale. So how can we stay within national policies but help scientists engage internationally? So we launched this program. So for example, the first two programs, let me describe uh, them to you in a little detail. The first program, we took a number of mathematics centers in the US that we fund. We took a few of them and asked them, if you were to collaborate with somebody abroad, uh, who would you pick? So we gave them money to organize a workshop, and they came back with us. They identified five institutions in, in Asia that they already had contacts with. Then we went to the government abroad and told them, we fund $6 million a year to our scientists. Would you fund $6 million a year to your scientists so that the two can work together? They came back and said, we will fund $20 million a year to our scientists and we will receive American scientists to go over. And so that's a leverage. We started another program with Finland in the area of wireless communication. 11 American institutions are engaged in this. So this is a way in which we can generate new funding and new opportunities. Since October of last year, in one year, we have 12 major savvies that have been created. I want to mention two of them that are of particular interest for young people. In July of this year, we signed an MOU with the European Commission. So we take several hundred NSF-funded young faculty members and postdocs, and we will give them an opportunity that if they want to go to any one of the 27 countries in Europe for an extended stay, we have an agreement with the European Research Center, the Research Council, that NSF would fund for a couple of years in the US, and the European Research Council will fund American scientists to work in Europe for up to a year, including their salaries, and provide them research support while they work in European institutions. So we are working on a similar mechanism, hopefully for up to 1,000 graduate students per year, NSF graduate research fellows, to have an opportunity abroad where we fund their stay in the US, but if they work abroad collaborating with uh, our colleagues, that we provide opportunities for them uh, through funding from uh, overseas sources. Another example that I want to mention is a program that was launched last year. So our mandate is to fund American scientists. The US Agency for International Development, USA, USAID, their mandate is to fund developing countries with American taxpayer money. So until last year, USAID and NSF were doing their job unbeknownst to each other. And USAID doesn't have the infrastructure to support science. So about a year and a half ago, we got together and we decided that how about if we collaborate and coordinate the funding so that American scientists who receive NSF funding have coordinated research activities in developing countries where they do research. It's already going on. And developing country scientists who want to engage with American scientists will have well-coordinated mechanism and funding uh, so that new knowledge can be created. So we launched this program in July of last year at NSF with Dr. Rajiv Shah, the, the head of uh, USAID. And in the first year, we had six projects. For example, 
scientists at Columbia University uh, do research in Bangladesh in water. And until last year, they were on their own. Now we can coordinate. So scientists from Bangladesh can benefit from the facility in uh, Columbia, and Columbia University scientists have coordinated funding for their collaborators in Bangladesh. This year, we have 200 projects. I mean, 200 applications for 42, 42 or 43 funded projects. And this is already in one year, several hundred million dollars of funding opportunity, which goes a long way in developing countries. The interesting thing is it doesn't cost NSF a penny extra beyond what we already do. Uh, it has a huge impact on an overseas scale. It empowers researchers in developing countries to address problems and especially major global challenges. And 42 projects are in progress this year. Another initiative, which again doesn't cost much money, um, is the following. Um, so if you look at the demographics in the country, one of our biggest challenges is homegrown American scientists in the next few decades. Uh, women staying in scientific workforce, underrepresented groups in the scientific workforce with rapidly changing demographics in the country. And these people are highly underrepresented in science right now. So take women as an example. 70% of all the college, uh, all the high school valedictorians in American high schools today are girls, 70%, and it's increasing. 20% more young women graduate from college than young men do, and that gap is increasing. In the last decade, there was a 10% increase in the number of PhDs in science and engineering in the US. That entire 10% increase was due to women getting PhDs in science and engineering. But if you, so 41% of all the science and engineering PhDs in the country are women, but they represent only 26% of the workforce. So if that is the case, what, what can we do to retain more of these highly talented people to stay in the workforce? There are many factors, many complica complicating factors, but one of the key factors that many studies have identified, and this is a study out of Berkeley, that showed that it's the career life balance issue that is the biggest factor in women, um, at least definitely American women, not staying in the STEM workforce. So we launched a program at the White House. In fact, it was the first NSF program to be launched at the White House, this time by the First Lady. And Dr. John Holdren and I, uh, articulated, a, it's not up to NSF, it's actually more a US government policy, a, a wish list, if you will, that 10 years from now, we would like to see the number of women in the STEM, PhD level STEM workforce to be 41%, which is today's production of PhDs, but 50% above where we are today with respect to the STEM workforce. If we reach that, it'll be a phenomenal success. We don't know that. So how do we reach that? It's not up to NSF. So we are now partnering with NIH, NASA, and uh, the, the presidents of uh, AAU and APLU have signed a memorandum with me that they will work with NSF to see if universities can partner, and take best practices, and spread this. So this is something that we want to pursue uh, for the future. In the area of innovation, we have a number of activities uh, that we can talk about, but I'll just, uh, sh uh, historically, and not just in the past, going into the future, NSF will always focus on basic research. We will not change that. But having said that, there are a lot of things we can do to nudge the innovation out of basic research into the marketplace, and there are many programs that N NSF has been involved in, and one program we launched last year is called the NSF Innovation Core. Oops, sorry. Um, NSF Innovation Core, which is the red line that you see in the middle. And the idea is to take output of basic research and to see if for a small amount of money that universities spend now, whether we can support it to extract value out of this. So why is this important? If you look at innovation in the US, NSF has supported it in a major way, so. And fortunately, the uh, National Science Foundation came along at just the right time and offered uh, a grant for small business. Qualcomm was uh, very small when it received its first SBIR grants, I think in the order of 15 people or so. That helped us continue ahead, grow, develop some technology. Well, it meant the difference between starting and not starting. <laughs> it, it meant everything in those early days. And now today, 
It employs um, over 18,000 people. We now employ something over 21,000 people. It all started with that little $25,000 grant. And so these things have very large multiplier factors to them. What, what really causes economic growth is it's always innovation. So how do we get more of it? We invest in basic research. That's as simple as that. So our goal with this program is to create a virtual national network. So in one year last year, we funded 100 projects, created three national nodes at Stanford, Georgia Tech, and Michigan. And this year, there'll be two more nodes, and we will add 200 additional programs and 100 mentors and volunteers uh, who are CEOs and CTOs. So by creating this network, our goal is to provide a lot of opportunities, especially for those institutions that are not part of this ecosystem. The other activity that we want to focus on, especially with the rapidly changing educational enterprise, is what can we do as knowledge enterprise becomes borderless? So there's been a lot of press lately about MOOCs, uh, other online educational media and others. Uh, how do we bring that in? And how do we integrate social, behavioral, and economic sciences with natural sciences? This has always been a politically charged item in Washington, especially when it came to, comes to NSF support. But this is something that uh, uh, is significantly important as we move forward. And uh, so we have a lot of ongoing discussion right now about what can NSF do uh, with respect to massive online open education that links large institutions with community colleges, for example, which we support to the tune of several hundred million dollars a year. Let me just end with um, one of the questions that I posed at the beginning when global enterprise and science is borderless, glo global scientific enterprise is borderless, um, but our individual activities of funding agencies are constrained by rigid boundaries. How do we go, th go through these boundaries and how do we engage most effectively? Even more importantly, as rapidly developing countries with large populations increasingly and invest in science and engineering, what can agencies like the National Science Foundation or other science funding agencies in different countries, what can we do collectively to move forward with co-funding and other ideas? So the biggest barrier right now is um, all the major players having a common understanding of what constitutes a rigorous peer review, what constitutes research integrity, intellectual property, migration of young scientists, et cetera, et cetera. Who will craft these principles? Who is responsible for it? It's not the State Department. It's not the presidents and prime ministers of the countries. Who's going to do it? So we formed a virtual loose organization. It's virtual because there is no budget, there's no secretariat, there's nothing. Uh, called the Global Research Council in May of this year. Uh, my counterpart from Norway uh, participated in that, uh, in that effort. And uh, out of this came, so we released principles of, for scientific peer review, and we also created this virtual entity called the Global Research Council. Uh, the week after that, Science Magazine invited me to write an editorial, and they asked me if there is one sentence that you would pick that you would highlight um, as, a, as a key sentence in your editorial, let us know what it is. So I picked this sentence, um, that good science anywhere is good for science everywhere, but the qualifier is good science. And uh, the good science has to have good peer review, good research integrity, good respect for intellectual property, and good institutions to nurture them. So this is the meeting that we held, and uh, Arvid, you are there somewhere. I don't know where, where you are, but uh, uh, I just want to close with where it's going to go next. So next year, Brazil and Germany will co-host uh, this meeting in Berlin at the end of May, and they've taken up two topics of major interest to all of us. One is research integrity, where the Western countries uh, have uh, good, good uh, mechanisms, but it's especially important for developing countries. The other one is a very thorny issue of open access to publications and data. Who will create the policies? Who will create the archiving mechanisms? And more importantly, who will pay for it? And the people who participated in this one meeting sitting around this table, by my approximate count, represented about more than 90% of science and engineering funding on the planet. 
if that group is not capable of developing the policies to address this issue, I'll be very depressed. <laughs> so I'm very hopeful that a few years down the road that we will have an opportunity to make significant progress on this. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention, and let me start. Thank you. Thank you very much, Subra. I want, let me just mention, we're going to take some questions in a minute, and the mics, the, my colleagues, wherever they are, have microphones, and so please wait for the mic to come uh, to ask your question. But l let me point out that, of course, Subra hasn't been able to talk about all the exciting things going on at NSF, but these, these are initiatives. I mean, uh, Subra has been there two years. It's quite extraordinary, I think, the innovative uh, uh, projects have been put in place under less than totally desirable political circumstances, uh, I, I would say. Maybe life will get better. So uh, uh, what you're seeing, I think, is what uh, a science leader, science policy leader can do in an agency like NSF. It's just really very exciting. He does it in cooperation with a wonderful staff at NSF, but also the National Science Board. And we're very fortunate that the past director of the National Science Board, uh, Dr. Ray Bowen, past president of Texas A&M, is with us today. So please uh, think about some questions. Let me start by saying what's going to happen with the budget? Is NSF going to come back out and sequester money from us? Uh, what well, would you say? Let, let, me, let me summarize what I know so far, which many, all of you know as well. So the, the president has proposed for 2013, so that's the budget we are waiting for right now. The president has proposed an increase of 4.8% for NSF. The Republican House Appropriations Subcommittee has marked up an increase of 4.2% for NSF. The Democratic Senate Appropriations Subcommittee for NSF has marked up an increase of 3.5%. So in the most optimistic scenario, if, it, if that plays out, we will end up somewhere between 3.5 and 4.2 percent, which, which in this climate is not bad. That's the very optimistic scenario. A very pessimistic scenario, it's projected by many, AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and also the Office of Management and Budget recently released a report. If there were to be a sequestration, and if that were to happen with, the, with its fullest feared impact, then all federal funding agencies, including NSF and NIH and DOE, will see a reduction of 8.2%, which will mean 1,000 fewer awards. That's the very pessimistic scenario for next year. The very optimistic scenario is what I described. And uh, Neil mentioned uh, uh, Dr. Ray Bowen here. In fact, I have to say that I cannot take all the credit for all the initiatives because the, uh, as chair of the uh, National Science Board, Ray was extraordinarily helpful in welcoming me to NSF and offering a lot of support. And uh, I want to acknowledge uh, uh, Ray's support as well. Thank you. Um, I have a comment to the open access issue, which I think is extremely important. But there's one aspect there which you probably will be reflecting on. Open access is not just good, because any idiot can make an open access journal, and many idiots do. So uh, we actually have an issue of quality control here. So I think the key issue to handle, and where I really think the Global Research Council have a wonderful chance, is to make a neutral web of science database that is not commercial and is ensuring that factors like impact factor, et cetera, are being handled in a sober way. Because not only can you make an open access journal any idiot, you can also artificially opt your own impact factor very easily. And I'm not quite sure how the quality control in the web of science, how good that is. And at any rate, it's commercial, which somehow doesn't seem right. So I think there's something which can be done here, which is reasonably easy, extremely important, and also politically not so easy, because I see also when I look at who, where, where are the open, new open access journals based, I see that they are often in development countries. So if you could maybe make a yeah. comment on this. So when I say open access, so from our perspective, 
um, open access, we are talking about um, how do we create open access to taxpayer-funded research. And of course, anybody can create a journal and uh, anybody can profit from it. There are so many, the, the problem we have right now is there is no economic model. So if you take NIH, NIH is an open access model, which is PubMed, and which has been very successful. And the, and the, the important thing about open access is that taxpayer-funded research, which can lead to innovation by somebody who did not participate in that research. But that open access also makes it available for everybody anywhere in the world. So the question would be, how do we equitably give, take the resources from one taxpayer and make sure that there is a return on investment because it's all coming out of your tax money and my tax money, and how do we do this? And this is why I think having the major science funders involved in this is going to be very critical. There is another issue related to that. There is so much data embedded in publications, from tables that you present in a paper to hidden several layers that are hidden beneath that. And what kind of policies do we have for data? And oftentimes, some of the most useful data for industry is negative data. So negative trials in clinical trials, for example, which don't go anywhere, and nobody would accept a paper with negative result, and it's not even peer reviewed. But how do you capture the negative results? Software is another issue. So there are a lot of issues. I don't, I don't think that Global Research Council will get very far with it in one year, but it'll take a long time. And, but, but the nice thing is that uh, they are the funders of research, most of the research on the planet, so if they can get together and come up with policies, it'll be very, very helpful. Richard. So I want to share a story. Okay, thank you for your inspiring talk. Thank you for your leadership. Okay, I'm a fan of NSF, okay? So in the late 90s, when I was on National Science Board, we decided to bring in all the United States, uh, all, all the Nobel laureates that had won in the few recent years in the United States. We brought in Bob Curl from Rice, Rick Smalley, okay, uh, Bob Richardson from Cornell. And Rita Caldwell was leading, and she said, all of you that were there have been supported by NSF. And so look at the wisdom that we showed in supporting you, okay? And Rick Smalley jumped up immediately, and he told Rita, no, 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 that's the wrong way to look at it. You must look at, of all the pool of people who were not supported, how many would have won Nobel laureates had you supported them? Okay. <laughs> I think we can look at many different ways, half empty or half full. So, so if we, we don't fund, the, the number of proposals we fund is a um, uh, uh, lot, lot more than the number of proposals we fund. So we cannot call it the non-funding agency. We have to call it the funding agency, so. Uh, yeah, it is a set, yeah. But, but you know, it, it, that, that leads to another interesting question. What is the optimum fraction of all the proposals that should be funded that cannot be 100%? Uh, then there is no quality control. It cannot be 5%, which is too tight, so. One third. One third, well, yeah, possibly. Yes, please. I am uh, heartened uh, by your passion, your vision, and your capacity to build bridges across various organizations in Washington and beyond the country. Yeah, as you said, you know that's that's one of the most challenging pieces that you faced and we faced. But here is a question: with the tightening of the noose around uh, around the finances and the budgets. Are there any thoughts? Because when I see your presentation, when I've looked at NSF and other organizations, there is a huge translational piece where industry can play a partnership role with organizations such as yours. Have you thought about, or is there any thought going on in terms of that partnership? Okay, so the, the NSF is authorized by Congress uh, to uh, engage uh, private sector in different ways. And we've, we, there are many examples that I can talk about. For example, we fund a project called, in our biological sciences director, called Project Bread, which um, we fund $12 million. The Gates Foundation provides $12 million. This is in agriculture development in Africa. So half the money from, comes from the Gates Foundation. In the semiconductor industry, so we have a number of engineering research centers in the US 
which NSF funds. Um, the Semiconductor Industry Association has contributed significantly to that co-fund with us. Um, many companies together uh, provide resources. The i program that I just mentioned, which we launched last year, we, um, we approached several foundations and they all said, great idea, go do it. Um, so our response was uh, support means it has to hit the bottom line for you, otherwise words are cheap. So two foundations, the Kaufman Foundation of Kansas City, the Deshpande Foundation of Massachusetts, they both wrote a check to NSF. Not because in a $7 billion budget that's gonna make a huge difference, but it makes a very powerful statement that they take these activities very seriously. So we try to engage, but, but we have to be very careful because if, uh, if we get a lot of funding from industry, then we'll be accused of doing work that industry should be doing, why should you spend taxpayer money? So we have to walk away, it's the same with working with another agency. If we have a lot of collaborative research projects, we sometimes somebody in Congress criticizes us, if DOE is doing this and you're doing this, there's duplication. So collaboration is often misconstrued as duplication. And so we have to walk a very fine line politically we have time for one more question from Minister Halverson, or as many as she would like to ask. <laughs> okay, how much time do you have? <laughs> no, I'd like to thank you again, uh, Mr. Suresh, for a very uh, interesting presentation. We met this morning, and we've had also some bilateral uh, talks, which I also thought was very interesting. As uh, Arvid Halen said this morning, we are, you know, a small mice compared to you as a big elephant when it comes to research, but even a small mice has to contribute. So that's our, you know, slogan. So uh, we were discussing also the impact from the financial crisis when it comes to research and public financed research, uh, and also um, how private enterprises are investing in research themselves. And if the situation now is that public uh, financed research has to fill the gap because the private sector is uh, withdrawing. So I'd like to hear some comments from you on that topic. Thank you. Know, you. Thank you. You know, th this, is, this is a question as, as we briefly discussed a little earlier. Um, there, is a, there are a lot of pressures on federal funding agencies because of the changes that have taken place in the last uh, 20, 30 years with respect to industrial uh, support for research. Uh, you know, my own, uh, starting in the 80s, uh, when I had my first NSF career award, at that time it was called the Young Investigator Award, um, the, one of the requirements was that if you get money from industry, or nonprofit, NSF will match it dollar for dollar. And I didn't even apply for it. Ford Foundation, Ford Motor Company, and Allied Signal in New Jersey, they gave me funding which was matched by NSF without even applying for it because they looked at the list of new young investigator awardees from NSF and they picked the ones that were of, whose interests were aligned with their own uh, research interests and they provided support. That doesn't happen anymore. Bell Labs don't exist. Bell Labs, the way it existed before for basic research, it doesn't exist. So who would support that kind of a long-term perspective uh, for research? I think it's a, it's a major issue for us. That puts added burden on us. While philanthropic support and private nonprofit foundations like the Gates Foundation and um, others have significantly increased support, not all of that is for basic research. Some of that is for translational purposes. In other foundations, support often comes with um, uh, conditions on what the money could be used for, uh, even in a given domain, what specifically it should be used for. The third thing is that, especially for universities, universities like Rice, which have a very strong portfolio in science and engineering, you need to cover the cost of the overhead and uh, engineering and science education uh, it comes with a lot of overhead compared to humanities and, and uh, who has, somebody has to pay for it and the federal funding agencies are the only ones paying for it and even that support is not enough to support the universities at the present time. So how do we make sure um, and, and there is no other way of support other than uh, 
philanthropy right now, and, uh, and this is a major challenge facing universities. So we can engage industry, but the other thing that uh, Dr. Neil Lane pointed out earlier in our discussion is that at a time when industry is so short-term focused with quarterly reports, um, somebody has to take the long-term perspective, and it's a few federal agencies that have the luxury, still have the luxury to do this. So we don't have a whole lot of options in the present climate. Zubra, thank you for participating in the Transatlantic Conference. Thank you. Thank you for presenting this stimulating lecture. And thank you for being one of America's great model civic scientists. Thank you very much. Thank you.